Good afternoon, and welcome to Lifelong Learners. I'm your host, Terrence Perry, and I have a special co-host today. His name is Guy Wimper. He'll be, be my, my co-host. Uh, and also, I have the producer, Amnon Nissan. Also, uh, so we have a three-way tag team on today, but that's because we got a very special guest. Her name is Michelle Hill. Michelle Hill is a ghostwriter for athletes uh, throughout the NFL, NBA, soccer, any athletes in, uh, that's professional athletes. She's, she's a ghostwriter for, for them, and she's going to talk with us a lot about that today. So, uh, Michelle, how you doing? Awesome today. Can you hear me okay, Michelle? I can, I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, I can. All right. Well, Michelle, listen, I'm glad to have you today. Um, I, again, I have my, my new co-host with me today. His name is Guy Wimper. Uh, his, his son played in the NFL. We got a couple of questions that we want to ask you as a ghostwriter um, that you may can answer for us. And, and also the producer, Amnon, may have some questions for you. Amnon, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Keep going. All right. So, <laughs> listen, uh, we got... The call-in number, anybody that want to call in to ask Michelle Hill uh, any any questions or if they have concerns, they can call in at 919-518-9773. And we're going to jump right in because we have a barrage of questions that we, wanna, that we do want to ask Michelle. So, Michelle, can you start off by telling us a little bit about, about yourself and how you got into ghostwriting and just how that have catapulted you into the... Um, uh, the professional realm of ghostwriting for athletes. Well, yes. Um, I started, actually, um, I started my company in 2008, and I was living in Southern California at the time. Or, actually, I had lived a whole lifetime in Southern California in Orange County, uh, Huntington Beach, Costa Mesa, you know, the whole Newport Beach. And I got caught in that 2008 financial debacle and was downsized for the third time in nine years. And during that two and a half years of, of being unemployed yet again in California, um, and there really are no jobs in California, uh, it's true, <laughs> um, <laughs> for sure. Um, I decided I wanted to, I had an entrepreneurial spirit anyway, and I wanted to marry my love of football with my love of writing. And I thought, how can I do that? And I was attending, an, I attended an AME church. And I, during a seminar, somebody was talking about having an NFL client. And I found myself, I was just so, in a good way, I was so envious. Like, I want an NFL client. And so I thought, how can I do that? So that's where I married my love of football with my love of writing. And I started Winning Proof. Um, I wrote for free for two years for sportsnetworker.com um, blogs. Uh, you know, for them, I wrote a, an article or so for Access Athletes and just did a lot of uh, pro bono work in just trying to get my name out there. And for up until this last year, I uh, was working on like website content and, um, you know, more marketing material, uh, stuff like that. So, and I thought, you know, I threw LinkedIn and I have to say a hundred percent of my business comes from LinkedIn. That has been a fabulous tool for me to gain business. And I think I have now maybe almost 5,000 connections, but they're connections that I forged one by one by sending invites. But um, a former NFLer from way back, um, I'm ghostwriting uh, his book, and I find the process exhilarating, and I thought, I'd rather do that than just write all this piece, piece work. I'd just rather um, write books and, in, you know, and help just get uh, these guys out there, and it's a added stream of income. It does so much good. You know, when they give speeches, they can have a, you know, say book sales in the back of the room. So I hope that answers your question. Hey, that, it does. It, it, it answers one of my questions, but, of course, <laughs> it, it only opens the door for uh, more questions. Um, but, okay. again, my, my, my co-host, 
uh, Guy Wimper, his uh, his son just retired, uh, retired from from the NFL, and um, so that's one reason I want. Uh, he had a couple questions that he wanted to to, uh, well, not necessarily just questions, but something that he wanted to kind of share with you and kind of ask you your um, your opinion of, about that. But let me ask you, 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 you said that you had merged your love of writing and your love for uh, of football to get into the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the ghost writing. But before that, you also were doing some writing for Huffing, uh, what's it, uh, Huffington Post as well, as far back as, um, I guess you've been writing for much of your adult, adult life as a, a professional writer. Yeah, that is correct. And I, I had a natural writing ability as a child. It's it's an innate gift. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm the, the brightest and the best writer ever, 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 because a lot of writers are prima donnas and, the, you know, my writing is the best and nobody touch it. Um, that's not me. But um, I have an innate talent for it. Whenever I was in school, grade school up through high school, um, Whenever the teacher said research report, paper, essay, my heart leapt for joy. I loved it. So it's always been in me. So I've just tried to hone that craft. And I realized once I got into uh, working my business that how much I didn't know and how much I needed to increase my writing. And that's why I, uh, you know, gave my writing away for a while. And I would see websites um, that j from former NFLers that were just riddled with errors and so I would contact them and say hey so I can use your name on my you know referral or client list can I just clean up your website for you and you know I got several you know uh, good uh, maybe a, a few a few mm -hmm. by doing that so um, that's how you know that's how I progressed but it's a, it's an innate talent and I see even with an innate talent you still have to hone it. You still have to develop it. You still have to, to increase your skill, your knowledge, and you know, and then add in divine enablement to make it all work. Uh, Michelle, uh, <clears throat> I have a question. I think I already know the answer. I just want to go ahead and ask you, um, along those lines, though, you talked about uh, helping some NFL players out. Why would an NFL player use you as a ghostwriter? Um, um, they would, okay, well, they would use me because they want to write a book. They have an idea for a book in their head. Mm -hmm. They don't have time. They don't have the writing talent to get it done. Um, maybe they're current in the league, and I'm definitely, with football season coming up, definitely not, you know, they don't have time. Off season, you know, there's other things going on. So you hire, they would hire me because of time and writing ability right and uh just you know stuff like that just they would just hire me because they they have an idea but they don't know how to execute it and that's what i thought you know their 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 expertise is on the field uh i'm not saying they can't be a writer but uh that's what i thought that uh they would go to the expert just like they on the special teams that has people that specialize in has special skills and they uh the coach uses them in that capacity, so I guess they would use you in the writing capacity to get their story story out there. Um, Correct. Thank you. Let me let me ask you also, Michelle. Um, in terms of now, I've written two books myself, and also Guy Wimper. He's he's written a book uh, that we'll be talking about um, a little bit later in the show. But again, just in the process of of of, of writing. I know for myself, it's difficult to get my words uh, to get my words to run smoothly on the page. So I, you know, I have to have an editor and well, editors <laughs> to rewrite some of what I've written many a time just <clears throat> just to make it sound better, to make me sound better, to make me sound more professional. Uh, so that. That made me think about you when you said that you, um, you know, as a ghostwriter, that you do a little bit more, more of the writing um, to help, to I guess to put the, you know, not just the words, but actually the whole paragraphs and, you know, think to put things in sequence. To when you talk about an athlete's life, you're talking about a journey from before they became the athlete to 
why they are still athletes or even after they are retired from being an athlete. So I know that's a lot that that's a lot of work and as a writer myself I know it's difficult to do. So for someone that's never written, I can understand um the the, uh, the reason that they would need help w with someone like yourself as a writer. Um I would need someone like yourself also um even in you know in my writing. So um I know what you do is a lot of uh, behind the scenes, but it, that's a lot of work. What would something like that cost um, for the, I guess the, I won't say, I guess the average athlete or a or, or person that's trying to to, to write a book, an autobiography of, of, of some sort, what would all of that take and how much would, would that cost in terms of you helping them to put that out, out in the, uh, you know, out in the, in the market? Um, that is an excellent question, um, and people are often um, get uh, shell shocked when they find out how much pure ghostwriting is, because it is no small task and it is extremely time intensive. So the cost, um, and I will give throughout some numbers in, in a quick moment, but the um, since it's so time intensive, and I also provide unlimited you know consulting through the project then I provide the subcontractors as far as formatting the book and I don't actually edit the book if I'm going to ghostwrite it I want another editor because I call it copy blindness you know and you just get so used to and I'm sure you know that too you get so used to seeing your own words that it's easy to to skip really minor you know a little minor mistakes how did I miss that so I do send you know the the books that I ghostwrite off to an editor as well, but the it all depends on the price. Um, as far as if the person has things written already, I'm working with two uh, recently former NFLers that are writing a book, and I'm they have it written. They're writing it themselves, and basically for me, it's cleanup and it's organization of the content. That would be much less than. Full ghost writing. Full ghost writing. A two hundred page book is going to run fifteen, twenty, twenty five thousand dollars from start to finish. So it can be really pricey. Not a lot of people have that uh, kind of money laying around. So you know, not everybody can opt into that. You know, that price range to word polish some existing content. That would be more all, the, and it, again, it depends on the the amount of pages, how much cleanup it needs. But that would be much less. Um, you know, sometimes I charge per month uh, a monthly fee, a, a down payment, and a monthly fee. Sometimes I just will um, charge a per word uh, cost. So for word polishing, and I don't have my my pricing right in front of me, but I would say. It ranges up until probably forty six cents a word, somewhere in there, to word polish a document that's already written that just needs cleanup. It could be up to almost a dollar a word, not quite um, for full ghost writing if you put it on a per word basis, which runs into you have fifty five thousand words. It's going to run into you know fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, or more thousand dollars. Probably more. Wow, that <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, you're scared. You're scaring me. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, it scares um, a lot of people because you know, and and the the ghostwriters like the premier star ghostwriters. I mean, it can be upward to a hundred thousand dollars. You know, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars to ghostwrite. A book, someone who is you know writes for stars and writes for um, that has you know you New York Times bestseller books on their on their list. So it can get really pricey. So my prices are really um, on the lower side compared to that. But they're still you throw out that kind of number twenty thousand dollars and you know people tend to freak out. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm in the process of writing my my uh, a third book, and and it is an autobiography, and it's it's going to be about 200 pages. But I also do need, as you said, that word polishing. Um, so that's what I look for after I write the book. 
I get an editor or someone that can word polish for me. Uh, yeah. And so, that's a lot less. That's a lot less with, with existing content than it is to just do the ghost writing, conduct the ghost writing process, which is the interviews, having them transcribed, you know, making sense out of them, and then fleshing it out with detail and feeling and all the other elements. So that, that's definitely a conversation that I would like to have with you off, off camera, uh, but that is something that I know that I need. Uh, and there may be others out there too that, that may uh, need that type of, uh, that type of, I guess, editing and, and, uh, and, and that type of book help. So again, anyone that's listening that may be interested or have questions, do call into the show. You can call in at 919-518-9773. We have Michelle Hill. Uh, she's a she's a professional ghostwriter for athletes, uh, but also she uh, she helps for the common man or woman. I say also, um, Michelle, is there anything? Um, is there a way that anyone that want to get in contact w uh, with you can do that? Um, can you give us your social media um, content, emails, uh, gmails, or phone numbers to to be contacted? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my website is winningproof.com, and I have a contact page on there. And my uh, email address is winningproof at gmail.com. Uh, they can contact me there. Um, that is, those are the best ways to contact me to set up an initial uh, conversation. Yeah, you have any, any additional questions? Yes, yeah, uh, Michelle, uh, I don't know if Terrence line is up like that, but it, it fits. Uh, like I was starting to explain to you before, um, when we initially started talking before we went on air, um, my son just recently retired from the NFL. He, he started playing football at five years old, and he always had a dream to play professional football. I tell people in, this, uh, in, a, in a, a chapter of a book that I co-authored, uh, I didn't write the whole book. I just co-authored a chapter. It's me and 16 other authors from around the country answering a call to young men or we're trying to uh, give our point of view to try to help young men be successful. Anyway, um, <clears throat> my son Guy Jr. had this had this dream to play uh, since he was five. Um, he went all the way up to turn pro and two years after he was drafted by the New York Giants, they won the Super Bowl, Super Bowl in 2007. And Guy uh, was an outstanding athlete. He played all sports. He ran track, baseball, football, basketball. He actually had a scholarship to play basketball, a full ride at Yale. And I was trying to convince him, Guy, <laughs> Yale, we're talking about Yale. You get the ring. <clears throat> all you got to do is go into corporate America and put your ring on the table, and you automatically hire for no less than 150000 a year. Uh, he told me at that time, Dad, I play basketball, just stay in state for football. So he was right, and because uh, uh, he got drafted uh, by the NFL, uh, New York Giants. He might have been an average basketball player, but he uh, turned pro, and uh, two years later uh, won the Super Bowl with that team. And like I said before, me and 16 other authors from around the country co-authored this book called The Call. And our chapter was on leadership. Call stands for character accountability, love, and leadership. And I wrote a chapter on leadership describing how I raised my son uh, to fulfill his dream. And so in that editing process, I'm well aware of that. Uh, they, they kept sending my stuff back, saying it was too long, I was saying too much, <laughs> get to the point, cut this out, cut that out. So I'm, I'm aware of that process. But I would like that story about his life and his football career to get out there and to try to help some young men because um, everybody – not everybody, but most young men uh, want to be a professional athlete in some form, most of uh, the young men in the community. And less than 1% even get to play college-level football. And then to go into the pros is just truly a blessing. Uh, I always say that some of your best athletes are not on the professional court or in the, on the professional field. Some of the best athlete, athletes in those fields are out here in these parks and playgrounds. Uh, they just never got that chance to fulfill their dream. So I would like for him to tell his story. So we will be talking later on about how he can get his story out there. And even though he was a communication major, um, 
is writing, he's going to need some help. <laughs> Let's just face it. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit, like Terrence off camera, we'll be talking a little bit later on about that. I just want to put that out there, um, how it's just unique that uh, Terrence asked me to co-host today, and it's, it's right along the lines of stuff that I would like to discuss with you anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you with with athletes, you know, there's so many in the NFL, but each one is just like any other profession where each one, you have your own unique story. He has yeah. what he has learned specifically through his journey might not be what, you know, somebody else has gone through. Right. So, you know, each one has a particular, you know, details and, you know, I, that's what I love. And I love the reason I love working with athletes is because their mentality, you know, I can relate to overcoming obstacles and having right. determination and tenacity and just the will, you know, to keep on going. And um, John Maxwell in his book, Talent is Never Enough, says, you know, you can be the most talented person in the world, but if you don't have heart if you don't have the determination and the tenacity then you know you still might not be successful so that's why i love working with the athletes they have that they know what it is they overcome obstacles they know what it is to to um just i'm going to do this uh, uh, but you know by any means necessary really right. and i just love that winning attitude yes and also just a little a little bit of, of, of my son's story he actually in, in college, uh, second year in college, he wanted to quit playing football, even though he was doing his job and uh, uh, playing for a team that, you know, they wasn't winning a lot of games, but he did his job. He played four different positions at the, at the college level. And he actually wanted to quit football and join the Army. And I'm like, son, you too big. You know, he's like 6'6", six, six, 320. I said, you, they don't have uniforms that big. <laughs> you know, you just, uh, dad got your back. He was feeling a little frustration here. Had a child at that time, and uh, he just wanted to be responsible for his child, so he felt he had to get a job and go to work, and he wanted to join the Army. And I, I, uh, let's work on that. Let's take a look at that. Uh, as a father, I had his back you know, his whole life. I just wanted to continue that process. So uh, in that instance, I think we both made a good decision because he got to fulfill his dream. Yes. Yes. Excellent. And Michelle, again, I just uh, I want to thank you for 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 coming on the show. Um, it was sort of last minute when we uh, decided to to do this, but I, I appreciate you being there and you know just in in having a conversation. I knew that you would be an ideal person to to be on the show to talk to today. I knew that uh, also the guy uh, was coming on the show, so I wanted us to kind of have a dialogue and. And and also after talking to you and and and, and knowing him, um, he and I uh, work with um, with guys in recovery, and I know when I talked to you, you said you know something about recovery also. Um, so that's 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 one of the things that we all share in common when it comes to uh, we have athletes around us, we have uh, athletic, I guess backgrounds ourselves, and and also writing. Um, you know, as as writers and and uh, but also in recovery because we understand that there's a lot of family members that 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 have addictions. Um, I know I I myself went th through that recovery process, and that's what kind of got me into got me into uh, uh, writing about it. That's one of the things that I write about, and one of the things that I write about is also you know that autobiography of that transition. Can you share a little bit about that transition, not necessarily from your own life, but in, uh, you know, if there's like family members around you that, that, you know, that you've seen go through that transition uh, or that process? Um, absolutely. I have not experienced it myself. Somehow the, um, the family, you know, alcoholism skipped me and landed on my kids, unfortunately. So my daughter has struggled greatly with alcoholism, drug abuse, and all of the lifestyle that goes along with that. Um, she's 35 now, and uh, in Ca Southern California, both of my, my kids are. And um, I am not sure because there's no, you know, the communication is not there. I reach out and reach out. So um, from a personal standpoint, it's hard to see someone you love go through the stages of 
the transition. She has been in transitional housing. She was uh, in a in a recovery house one time, a transitional house, uh, pregnant, you know, of course, unmarried, and just, um, you know, trying to make her way. It seemed to really do a lot of good for her, and it turned her around uh, for a while. So, but she has, you know, had some relapses. So I have some, you know, as a long line of, of family members who have struggled with prescription drug abuse, alcoholism, drug abuse, I know a little something about being on the other end of watching that and how painful it is to watch to watch that. And Michelle, I, I wanted to add that um, being an NFL dad, you know, I got kind of close to some of the players and, and my son, and we both know that, you know, substance abuse is rampant in, uh, in professional sports. And it, it's a killer of the careers. Uh, I've seen so many athletes um, have promising careers on top of the world, people looking up to them, and they just can't shake that addiction that they had from a young man. Uh, it might have got covered up in high school and college, uh, not in the pros, not to have all this money. And they have people willing to just give them drugs, uh, give them alcohol, uh, just to be close to them. Uh, but some of the people uh, have ulterior motives. But um, I, was, I was very lucky that I'd have to witness my son go through that, that, that problem. Uh, but it was around him. Uh, he, when he tells his story, I'm sure he had, can tell uh, many stories. Um, I just remember one time he told me he was uh, on that, uh, the, the Giants, and um, I'm not going to mention any names, but uh, the guy next to him, a well-known athlete, a lot of kids looking up to him, you know, offered him pills right there in the locker room. And said, "Hey, you know, you don't need this, my son. No, I don't. Um, so, I hope these athletes that you're golf riding for do, if they have that problem, that they mention it, and and don't glorify it, and try to tell these young men out here that's looking up to them that, you know, that's that's a career killer. That's if you get a career, because you get involved in it early enough, you might not even get a career to play at the professional level. Uh, it destroys lives. So that's why." Uh, I'm glad Terrence and me, I call him my brother in the struggle, uh, so we can get that message out there that that, that stuff kills. Point yes. blank. Straight to the point. You, you are right. It, it's a career killer. It's a, a, a life killer as far as it might not kill you physically, but it kills your potential. It kills hope. You know, it just, it kills a lot of things, but yes. it's not unconquerable. It can be conquered. It has, you know, I have a long-term friend who is was a um, an alcohol. Wait, I'm 25, 26, seven years ago was um, in NA and AA, a cocaine addict and an alcoholic, and he's been clean for 26 plus years. So, you know, it does happen um, quite frequently, you know, and it, it can be conquered, but it's a powerful stronghold in a life. Yes. And like I said, uh, back to you telling their stories, um, that's, a, that's the perfect platform, you know, to address that. You know, it's not only athletes, it's American society around the world, really. Yeah. But in America, it's, it's really uh, destroying lives. You know, like I said, it is a life taker. Um, so many kids have potential. I mean, I, I've heard about so many kids uh, could get to the next level. But they just, they throw it all away, you know, uh, behind drugs and alcohol. So I hope we can together uh, get the message out there to help save some lives. You know, just uh, my son had that dream at five years old. So uh, most young people have dreams, and um, just let them know that if you go down that road, you got a chance of wiping your dream completely out along with your life. And that's all I'm gonna say on that. Thank you. Absolutely, yes. And and I know heroin is making a comeback, has made a comeback. Oh. And just to see uh, what that does, you know, to, to young lives is just really devastating. So, you know, the, telling the story of people that have recovered, that have been there, um, can really make an impact of, you know, I, I've never took drugs. I'm not a drinker. I, I haven't done that. So I have compassion still. I see it and I've seen it in my family, but I haven't experienced it firsthand. So, you know, the, uh, the people, who, the individuals, Terrence, you've experienced it firsthand. 
you know, what, what, how strong and powerful that addiction is, but that it is overcomable. You, you did overcome, you did get past it and, you know, it's no easy task, but, you know, you can talk to the youth, the athletes and say, you know, tell your story and tell them there is hope. You can conquer it. Yeah, and you're exactly right, Michelle. Um, that's one of the things that one of the things that I look at, and one of the things that I I hope and try to do on a regular basis is to you know to to let let men and women know that there's a you know you most times everybody is looking outside of themselves for you know for <clears throat> for happiness uh, and to be you know to feel good about themselves. They're looking outside for different things to do, be involved in, and when they can't find those things, you know. They'll gravitate to anything, and like you said, uh, alcohol and drugs are easily accessible, and so you get lost in into those things on the outside of you. But you know, at some point, you have to go inside of yourself and really look at what it is that you've been trying. You know, you, you you've tried to cover up, and once you start unraveling that, and then start to get real with yourself, you begin to make that that uh, that transition. But that takes. That takes uh, it takes work. It takes it takes persistence, and it takes that 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 mindset of looking in in you know just looking inside instead of looking outside and just um, you know trying to just keep things moving all the time. At some point, you got to be still, and when you be still, you can't look at anybody else but yourself. Uh, uh, so you got to look at that reflection. A lot of times it goes back to, you know, our childhood uh, hurts, wounds, or what have you. But it's something that's, that, we're, that we're always trying to cover up and we're trying to run from. At some point, if you really want to get over that addiction, you know, you have to address it. So I got to a point to where I went to my knees, threw my hands up, and I knew that was, that was something that I needed to address. And at that point, that's when I had to get real with myself. And really look inside of what's in my heart, because I'm not doing what I really want to do, you know, because of of uh, alcohol. Once I put that aside, you know, everything that I wasn't doing in terms of I wanted to write, I wanted to, you know, uh, do a lot of different things, but that was getting in the way. So I had to ask myself, what do I really want? You know, what's more, what's more important? Mm -hmm. And when I I realized that my dreams they were more important than, you know, everything else had to go. It's a hard process, but it is a process. Uh, Michelle, listen, I want to thank you for being on the show today. Again, if you want to come back anytime, feel free to just let me know. And you know you got a seat, you know, you got a seat here with us. I'd love to talk with you more in more detail. And we'll definitely be talking about I need some book polishing. Uh, so... <laughs> You know, we definitely want to talk about that. And again, um, I just want to thank you for for coming on today and sh and sharing a lot, a lot that you did did with us. Well, so, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And let me ask you again: How can people get in touch with you before you go? Just can, can you tell us one more time how they can get in touch with you? Absolutely. Um, through my website, winningproof.com, W-I-N-N-I-N-G-P-R-O-O-F.com, or winningproof at gmail.com. All right. Well, listen, Michelle, again, thanks, thanks for coming on. Um, you have a great evening, and we'll definitely be in touch. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. All right. Come again. Okay, bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. And we're going to go back again to, um, I want to talk to now uh, my co-host today, which is Guy Wimper, um, but he's also my other special guest that um, I, I have on the show today. So we're going to talk to Guy a little bit more about, we you've heard a little bit about uh, his son played in the NFL. Um, he, he was an athlete, but also Guy himself has, has a lot of interesting stories that he can share with us, and we're going to get some of those stories out of him today. <laughs> uh, but even starting with that, uh, Guy is from Minnesota, and he used to hang out with Prince and Morris Day. So, Guy, can you start there and tell us a little bit about uh, about that experience growing up in Minnesota? Um, 
and hanging out with Prince. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, actually, I was born in Lauderdale County, Tennessee, and I, I don't know if anybody remembers uh, the story Roots uh, that was on TV, that series by Alex Haley. Uh, that's the same county that was uh, featured in that story. Uh, matter of fact, where I live is probably about, where I was born is probably about 15 miles from Alex, Hale, Alex Haley's house, which is a museum today. Uh, anyway, my family migrated north, uh, stopped in Illinois for a few years, and then they finally wound up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a very cold place. Um, I think I got there and I was 12 years old. Um, north Minneapolis, uh, as many people know, there's not many uh, African Americans in Minnesota. Uh, most of them uh, live with on the north side of Minneapolis or the south side of Minneapolis, and it, also, they call the Twin Cities because St. Paul is probably about like Raleigh Durham to uh, compare. Uh, I moved to the north side. I remember the first day uh, I had to go to school. I think the temperature was actually about 35 below zero. And I told my mother, I stepped outside. I said, Ma, uh, this is impossible. This place is like the moon. And she said, You going to school, boy? And uh, so I had to make decisions. Do I want to stay home with mom all day and be chased around the house with a belt, or do I want to go to school? So I decided to break out the door, and I started running. I lived two blocks from the school. I hit the first block, the end of the first block, I started crying, it was so cold. And I ran the second block, and as soon as I got inside the building, I was breaking icicles off the side of my face. Uh, it was very cold. And uh, and that's where I met uh, uh, Prince, uh, was at, it was at, um, Lincoln Junior High School, uh, Prince and Morris, uh, there was another guy, Terry Lewis, uh, they all played music around the community. Uh, and then I actually moved from the north side to the south side, I think Prince followed a little later on, and we attended Central High School. Uh, the band he had then was called Grand Central, uh, I guess he named it after Central High School. And I used to watch him uh, down in the park playing uh, in Minneapolis, on the north side, back to the north side, they have a, a, a band competition, the baddest band in the land uh, every year, who's the baddest band. And every year, at that time, Morris had a band called Flight Time. And Prince band was called Grand Central. And every year, they would always be the two final, final bands standing. They would always battle each other. One year, Prince would win. The next year, maybe uh, Morris and Flight Time win. But I knew at that time, that both of those bands uh, were special because they had a, a real good si sound and um, I guess they called it the Minneapolis sound, but uh, they had a real good sound and uh, like I say, they were high school, high school uh, students. Uh, and I just really enjoyed it. I got to uh, watch them play in the park for free and now it costs a lot of money. Well, we know Prince is gone, but uh, it's, uh, it was, that's a sad thing and it hurts my heart. But that's a story how I ran into those individuals. Uh, they didn't. They didn't ask you to play in the band, guy. You, you, uh. Uh, no. <laughs> actually, uh, <clears throat> actually, Prince. I had a. I had a. My aunt was married to a man. Uh, his name was uh, Buncey. Uh, that's his nickname. I don't even know. Uh, his real name was Leroy McGowan, I believe. But uh, she was married to him, and he had a band called Old Socks and New Shoes. <laughs> and uh, he was a musical genius also. And I remember Prince used to come, uh, like, be mentored by my uncle by marriage. And uh, I'm not saying that's where he got all the skills from because Prince had a, had a natural talent. But uh, he did sit up under Buncey and, um, and get some of his techniques, I believe. And uh, no, uh, I was not the musical person. Uh, <laughs> um, Later on, I would maybe sing a little bit in the choir, but I lost that voice. I like Michael Jackson. My voice changed. He kept going. I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know once you, you, I guess, left, you you transitioned into the, the military. You became a military guy, and I guess you traveled the world during, during that time also. So can you share a little bit about uh, from that transition, I guess, from high school to the military, and then, then um, how you... How you landed here in Raleigh, okay. North Carolina? Okay. Uh, I, um, as a young man uh, on the south side of Minneapolis, uh, I was involved, very involved with my community. I saw, you know, we didn't have a grocery store in our community, and uh, we had to go outside the community to, you know, get fresh groceries. And 
I got involved with a uh, man that like, kind of mentored me, and we started a co-op in the community. And um, we also, he wrote grants, and he had these grand ideas where the city was going to give us a couple blocks to put a grocery store and also build some uh, affordable housing. Uh, and I was involved in that kind of stuff, and I was also going to the University of Minnesota at that time out of high school. Um, and I ran out of money. You know, I ran out of money. I applied for all kind of stuff and um, didn't have the money. So I said, let me go in the military for a while, get a marketable skill. And actually, I was going to join the Navy. I went down to the recruiting station, and the Navy recruiter, I guess he went to lunch or something. And I'm standing there, and a Marine Corps recruiter sticks his head out the door and said, uh, oh, they don't come. They take two-hour lunches. Don't worry about them. They're going to be a while. So <laughs> come on in and sit down and got to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he got me. Uh, then I looked at the uniform. They had a sharper uniform. So that's how I joined the United States Marine Corps in 1980. Um, so I just my intention was just go in, get my little skill, and come on out. But uh, my first duty station was Hawaii, and uh, I loved it. I loved it. I had a blast, and uh, four years went by. And then uh, I had an opportunity to reenlist. Uh, because I, I wanted to, uh, during my four years, I never got a chance to go overseas. Uh, uh, they had, they would call a Westpac or Western Pacific float with the Navy. And so I had an opportunity to, to get on the Westpac, and that's all the uh, Far East country, the Philippines, Japan, Korea, all that. So uh, I reenlisted, did the Westpac, still having fun. Uh, next thing I know, eight years that went by. <laughs> and so I said, well, uh, I'm close to halfway, so... I wind up uh, spending my entire 21 years in the Marine Corps, mostly on the uh, Far East, Hawaii a couple of times. Um, and then I had to come back to the United States and uh, eventually, so uh, I chose uh, Cherry Point, North Carolina. And that took me to Havelock. At that time, my son was playing football. Uh, after I retired, he, he went on to East Carolina, so I stayed here in the state to watch him play ball. Uh, I got involved with the back by helping helping again. I started working for a mental health facility as a mentor, professional mentor. Then I went on to do a couple of programs, uh, prevention programs, substance abuse prevention programs, and case management. And I, so I did that career for a while. Um, and after I uh, put that down, I went into life coaching, and uh, I got involved with a young lady that. Uh, certified me as a life coach, and she's based here in the Raleigh area, and that's what bringing me, brought me to Raleigh. Uh, and before we, we go, I'm going to let Amnon ask you a couple of questions, and I, but I do want to talk about your mentor uh, here in Raleigh, your life coach mentor that's also a mutual friend of both of ours. Uh, okay. Amnon, you... Whatever happens, happened to the... To, to the plans of what you were going to build, that you guys were going to, uh, the co-op oh, and, oh, the, oh, the co okay. and the, all that kind of stuff when you went away. Did right. anything happen? Well, uh, I, I'll tell you this story. I, I got to put this in a book. Uh, <laughs> that guy, I consider him a genius and uh, very intelligent. And uh, like I said, he took people from the neighborhood. Uh, we And they were they were some shady characters. You know, he took the you know, criminal, <laughs> drug addicts, pimps, whores, all that. And we all came together. And we started a co-op, and uh, and the neighborhood loved us because we were people from the neighborhood. And they really respected that. In that time, most stores was closing down because of robberies or people stealing from them. Uh, but they never they never robbed our store. We were never stolen from. I remember one time I was laying in the bed, and a lady from across the street of the store called me and said the front door was open. You know, somebody had left the front door of the store open. Nobody went in the store, took anything, went down and closed it up. Uh, anyway, the, the guy. Uh, he got sick, and once the lead head was gone, remember all those shady characters? <laughs> the shadiness came back, and uh, it kind of fell apart. But what eventually happened, we never got the grocery store, but the two blocks that the city gave us for a dollar, uh, they were able to put affordable housing on that, on those two blocks. So I was proud that that did happen, but they never, uh, the grocery store never materialized. We had got as far as uh, we had some grant monies to do a, a, a survey. We hired people from the neighborhood to go around and, and survey the neighborhood, and they found that that, that grocery, that community could sustain uh, a grocery store that was like a half a block long. I mean, like a supermarket grocery store. <clears throat> it could sustain a half a block long with the other half as being a uh, 
parking lot, um, but that never took place. Uh, I guess once uh, the guy died. Um, but, you got any, any other okay. questions? No. I'm, 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 we'll, we'll talk later. I want okay. to talk yeah. about more current events. Okay. okay. So, so God, let me, um, let me let me backtrack a little bit when when you uh, I guess not left the uh, left the military, but when you came back to the states, you came to uh, Cherry Point, Havelock, that area, uh, and from there to transitioning into uh, the the Raleigh, North Carolina area, and uh, and you got into life coaching. There's a mutual friend of ours uh, that's just that's just Tracy Matt. Right. That's um, that's your life coach, uh, the one that's certified you in life coaching. Right. Uh, but she's also a friend of mine that she didn't certify me in life coaching, but we were uh, life coaching associates and 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 have been. And that's where our paths had had crossed um, when we were talking about back up a little bit more. Um, you. You do mentor for youth, but you also do is it taekwondo or karate uh, that I've seen you doing with 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 some of the uh, uh, I guess the the young folks. Are you still uh, are you still doing that? Uh, uh, yes. Um, let me back up a little bit more. Uh, I skipped over this in my, during my military career. Um, I volunteered during that time. It was the Gulf War. You know, the United States is always involved in some type of conflict, and I volunteered even though I at that time I was a um, electrical equipment repair person. I was supervising electrical shops and we did um, support type things. But uh, when the Gulf War came along, uh, I wanted to do my part. So I actually volunteered uh, to be a uh, infantry platoon sergeant. So I went to uh, the Gulf War as a platoon sergeant for security platoon. Uh, we were tasked with uh, providing security for the commanding general for Southeast Asia, the big guy over there in the area. We provided uh, security for his uh, for his safety. Also, we uh, rotated around. I we guarded some ammunition dumps. Uh, we also guarded a place in, at uh, Al Jabal, which was a recreation facility. Um, it's the only swimming pool in Saudi Arabia at that time. I don't have more now, but at that time, uh, the recreation center at that at that military facility was the only swimming pool in the country that I that I knew about. Um, did my time over there in the desert. I uh, never want to go back to the desert again uh, in that in that capacity. I mean, the desert is nice, but now you're laying out in the, in the sand, fighting off flies, it's 120 degrees, and people are trying to kill you. That's not fun. Uh, so, but uh, in my military career, I've always was interested in martial arts. Um, after, um, before, I said, yeah, before I went down to uh, Paris, before I went to Saudi Arabia, I um, was a close combat instructor and a drill instructor on Paris Island, uh, getting more involved in martial arts. Uh, matter of fact, our close combat unit actually sold the, the leader of that unit, actually sold a, a, a form of martial arts called a line to the Marine Corps. And uh, it's just a combination of different martial arts. And I, I like different martial arts. I don't, I'm not the type to say, hey, my art is better than your art. I think they all have something that can, people can use. And I focus on self-defense. Um, I study <coughs> Taekwondo, Judo, Jiu-Jitsu, uh, Shunru, uh, but I, I'm, I'm certified as a master in uh, what's called Kenpo Taijitsu, which is a combination of Kenpo Karate, uh, tai, uh, Jiu-Jitsu, and Muay Thai, which is kickboxing. Uh, my grandmaster, he, he came up with this system and uh, I'm right, presently right now ranked uh, the sixth degree black belt in that system. Uh, but uh, what I like about martial arts, uh, there's some, some evidence out there, research that shows that kids when they get involved in martial arts, uh, a lot of people think they become dangerous, but it's actually the opposite. They become more disciplined and, and they more reserved and conservative uh, because they know they can hurt people. So they, you know, they don't go for somebody just calling them a few names or, I mean, you put your hands on something different, but, you know, uh, just teasing and stuff like that. <clears throat> normal, more, normal martial artists that are true martial artists won't respond to that unless you put your hands on them. Then they're going to they're gonna do what they, they're trained to do. That's what I like uh, about martial arts. Yeah. And I think that's, 
I mean, and that, that is, is, is like you said too. That make a difference in because uh, in the youth, it, it, it builds their self confidence to where uh, they're confident. They're not worried about, I guess, necessarily being bullied and being taunted by name calling because their confidence level is a little higher just from that that type of discipline that's you know that that's, that's being taught. Um, so I get that, uh, but you are a diverse individual in that. Just from everything that, that you shared today, and we haven't even got, got into your your book yet, but I want to touch on that before we we get uh, before we wrap it up. But I, I still want to back up and and, and just uh, I want to give a shout out to to uh, uh, Tracy Mack and Owen for introducing us, uh, and also uh, with with Tracy Mack actually inspired me to do this show uh, because of a book that that Tracy wrote a, a few years back. Uh, the the book of purpose, and that book of purpose, after reading that book from cover to cover many a times, it gave me this idea of of recognizing that everybody have a purpose, and we have to share uh, that purpose and and that mission. So from her readings and from her being that coach, I, I guess uh, it made the light bulb come on in my mind um, of how to be a light and to to serve that purpose, but also it connected us, uh, and, and and again our background, some in uh, substance abuse counseling and in and, and coaching, and also as life coaches, we came together, and you know so we've worked in that capacity as well, uh, and we both written books, and so I want to go into the book that you you've uh, you've co-authored called The Call. I think you and, and, and Tracy and, and several others were a part of that. But I want to hand you your book. I want you to hold it up and just kind of tell us what the call is all about. Okay. What, yeah, what that's. Uh, Actually, Tracy didn't have anything to do with the book. She just uh, introduced me to the lady, Dr. Okay. Uh, Tawana Freeman, who got her. She was inspired by all the things that were going on with young men in the country uh, getting shot, uh, getting in trouble mainly uh, Trayvon Martin and others, uh, she felt that if some men could share their experiences or, or their knowledge and try to answer the call to young men, that was the whole purpose of the book, called Call, Answering the Call to Young Men. Uh, C stands for character. A is for accountability. Love is, uh, L is love. The other L is leadership. And I co-authored, I wrote a chapter on leadership, which I described how I raised my son from his childhood dream of five years old until he uh, stood on the opening kickoff for the 2007 Super Bowl as a member of the New York Giants, which they won that game. <laughs> uh, it was a very good game. But backing up to Tracy, uh, I mentioned before that I was, as a young man, I was mentored by what I personally consider a genius. And that's what I, even though I'm older than Tracy, uh, I consider Tracy a spiritual genius, uh, oh, yeah. a genius. And so I'm, I'm, I'm putting her guidance. Um, she, I, the reason why I got into life coaching, she came to Havelock, North Carolina, uh, where she used to live, next to the base at Cherry Point. And she, uh, every year she comes back down there and does an all-day workshop for free. And a friend of mine uh, convinced me to go to the workshop. And uh, after listening to Tracy and uh, Diane Hamilton, who came down and assisted her, I said, I want to do that. I want to be a life coach. Uh, I had been a, in the helping profession or helping people all my life. And I just saw a way to be certified and be a uh, gain more knowledge in, in helping people. And, uh, and I went to her six month certification process because there, you know there's life coaches out there. They can go on the internet and get it, a certification a day, but that's not truly, in my opinion, a true life coach. You, you have to get develop skills and practice. Uh, we had to do sample sessions. She she uh, corrected me and uh, she gave me more knowledge. Corrected me, gave me more knowledge, and. Um, and me took me under her wing, and um, also became part of what she called a strategic alliance. Right. She picked certain uh, members, uh, people she's coached, and people that she know, and put us together in an alliance so we can continue to help people. And that's where I met Terrence. He came to my graduation, and I'm glad he did. But like I said, we can we I see that kindred, uh, kinship, and what we're trying to do, just trying to serve the community because we see so much turmoil and chaos and and, and life devastation. And we're just trying to do our part to, to help alleviate some of that in some lives of young men and young women. 
right. So, God, um, let me ask you to let us know how how we can get the book. Um, if the book is on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, how we could get the book, and also how people can get in touch with you through uh, social media. Okay, like I said before, the book is called The Call. It's a uh, I am one of the Amazon bestsellers. Uh, Dr. Kawana Freeman put it together. And there's 16 of us, I'm the 17th author, uh, that wrote chapters in this book. Uh, each author, their book will have their name on So you'll see my name is on my book. And you can get the book through Amazon. Uh, but I prefer, because then you know, Amazon gets part of the money and, and some other people. Uh, and what I'm doing with the profits from selling my book, I'm trying to do a camp for young men and young women kind of like along what Steve Harvey does with young men. Uh, I'm trying to raise funds. I have a friend of mine that has a camp out here in the country, a uh, boxing camp, and uh, he said I can use it uh, to mentor some young people. So um, I want to get the book for me to get the uh, you know, majority of the monies. I prefer you get it through my website or by contacting me. Uh, then that way you, the book that you'll get is a book with my name on it. <laughs> uh, my website is um, it's called Guy Wimper. G U Y W H I M as in Mike P as in Paul E R dot com. That's my website. Uh, my Gmail is uh, Coach Guy Wimper all together at Gmail dot com. And you get you go on that website or go to my uh, Gmail and uh, and contact me and I'll get the book to you. Um, like I said, it's, it's, I'm trying to raise money uh, to for this camp. Also. Um, I would like to say that the other authors of this book are outstanding people. They have some good, great stories, uh, uh, personal stories. I, I wrote about raising my son. I, some of my stuff is in there about my time in the military and discipline and, and, and accomplishing your dreams. Uh, but I wanted to get the story because a lot of young men want to be, uh, become professional athletes. And he tells the story, my son tells the story that no matter what career you choose, doctor, lawyer, truck driver, it all takes the same characteristics. You gotta be able to listen. You gotta have a work ethic. You gotta have morals if you wanna be successful and other stuff. Uh, because of time wise, I won't go into it. But uh, if you wanna copy the book with my name on it, uh, <laughs> contact me. And like I said, it's for a good cause. I, I don't know what the other authors are doing with their monies, but I'm trying to still help the young men and women out there. Thank you. All right, God, man, listen, I appreciate having you on the show. It was in, it's inspiring every time I'm, a, I'm around you, but it's also uh, inspiring to, to see the things that you're doing now um, and the things that we've talked about doing some things together that I think is going to change the paradigm uh, in this area in a way of uh, a, a lot that have been going on and a lot of ways that we're going to help in the community uh, in terms of we're working with men and women in recovery, yes. we're working with youth, uh, and and just adding that spark and that inspiration to you know to uh, to help change lives. So I appreciate having you on today. You know you're welcome to come on anytime because <laughs> uh, you're doing a lot of different things all the time. So you know and just come by the show and you know uh, and let us know what's what's going on at the time. So. Okay. I want to thank my audience for listening in, uh, and you know we're here every Tuesday from t uh, two to three. You all join us every Tuesday. I appreciate having Guy on, and also uh, uh, Michelle both coming on today. And I want to thank the producer Amnon for hosting the show uh, every every Tuesday. So you out there have a great week. Until I see you again next Tuesday, uh, lifelong learning. Uh, so keep your mind open. Your mind is like a parachute. As long as it's open, you're going to land on your feet. It's going to be a soft <laughs> landing. Have a great one. Thanks. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler. 
Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Amnon Nissan. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.